Um, okay, hello everybody. Here we are, final session of the day. Um, we're excited to be here. Ah, Jennifer, excellent, you're joining there. I'll yeah. just pop you into the wing whilst uh, whilst I bring everyone on. Okay, everybody should be pulling over. As usual, just drop us a little note in uh, a little message in chat if you're seeing us. I like to know that I'm being heard. Okay, very good. Let me bring on the rest of our illustrious panel um, for this final session. Make sure I press all the right buttons here. Fantastic. There we go. One, two, three. Oh dear, I'm clicking the wrong thing. And four. All right, here we are. Can we all hear ourselves and each other? That's probably the first thing to check. Hello. Hi. Hello. Great. Okay. Well, Rachel, shall I hand over to you to uh, kick us off for the panel? You're taking over as host. I'm transitioning out of hosting into panel member, so I'll I'll take that hat off. I'm stepping into host mode. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. I, my apologies. I'm getting over a cold, so I feel better than I sound, I promise, but I might be a little raspy And uh, for today's discussion. I'm Rachel Cherry. I'm the founder and a board member for WP Campus which is a nonprofit organization and community that's focused on supporting professionals that use WordPress in higher education. And I'm excited to moderate this panel today. We have Jeremy Felt with us. Jeremy is the co-owner and lead developer for Happy Prime, which is a web agency with just vast experience with WordPress and higher ed. And we also have Jennifer Schroth. She's a director of online strategy and identity at Stanford Law School, whose team runs the beautiful Stanford Law School WordPress website. I definitely recommend checking that out after our discussion. So let's get started. We are going to, let's just dive in. I know we're running late today and I think we're, we have some flexibility to go over a little bit if y'all wanna hang around with us. But let's just dive in. We're gonna talk a lot about just kind of the state of WordPress and higher ed and also like open source, like why WordPress and open source is so great for our sector. So I kind of wanna ask our panelists, you know, why why do we think that WordPress is so valuable and used in higher education? Um, Jennifer, you want to start? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think the, the biggest reason that we chose it is because it's inexpensive and it's super flexible and that it's easy enough for us to maintain ourselves. So I think that's, <laughs> and it's a huge website. I mean, we have 60,000 pages and 300 content editors and we only have three people managing it. So I think that that speaks to why. Right. Like the inner, like WordPress and higher ed is just like inner, like extreme enterprise WordPress usage. So it's really fun to see how people kind of, how, how people use and kind of stretch WordPress in our ecosystem and have to get really custom and have lots of fun with it. What do you think, Jeremy? Well, those are the two biggest reasons I think cost and flexibility because uh, it's free and you can do anything you want and then the third I'm sure there are more is familiarity um, almost everybody now has used WordPress in some aspect of their life so it's pretty easy to wrap your head around uh, using it for your job if all of a sudden you need to figure something out and you need a website so. Yeah, almost it almost feels like of every you know WordPress is used in so many different contexts. But uh, I read it; it feels like WordPress is almost perfectly uh, designed to fit. Well, it's a pretty challenging brief, right? Like tons of websites, some of them high scale, uh, huge range of like capability in terms of being able to use them. Probably didn't start small in terms of budget, needs to scale. Like there's, there's a pretty challenging set of requirements. Um, you know, probably doesn't want to sign some big complicated technology agreement. Probably that's going to be really challenging. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that it's like actually, you know, WordPress's unique set of strengths like fits really neatly into into uh, the university's needs in a way that like is not always true for other, you know, big enterprise use cases. Maybe actually they don't care so much that it's low barrier to entry or it's super usable or something, you know, that, uh, they have a different set of needs. You do get a good point, like lack of bureaucracy sometimes. Like if you don't, if you're not having to go through and purchasing a proprietary, then you don't have to go through those hurdles, which is a real fun thing to do sometimes in higher education. Um, but, you know, some, so with that said, you know, it's, it's not nothing to set up a WordPress. You do have to hit some kind of bureaucracy hurdles. At least I would hope so. Um, I would hope there's some governance about setting up websites at your university. Um, 
let's talk about like the general usage, right? Like I've already mentioned, you know, higher ed is a kind of an interesting ecosystem of WordPress usage. So let's talk about like the general usage or the unique usage, I might say, of WordPress and higher ed. You know, what are your favorite plugins? Let's talk about content. Let's talk about, you've already mentioned a high amount of content and users and, and governance. So, you know, what are, what are our uh, favorite plugins that we that people in higher education use what do you think what do you think jennifer uh, okay so my personal favorites is post to post to build those relationships of all the content that everybody's adding every day to a person or an organization um the other ones i think are like gravity forms we use that for so much automation and workflow and to get content in uh to make it easier on folks and then uh, you know, Event Calendar Pro is another one, I think, because we put on like so many events every single year. Um, so I think those help make things run. <laughs> what do you think, Jeremy? Oh, plugins. Uh, my favorite plugins are, are admin plugins, I think. Um, I like Same. to try to keep sites as close to WordPress as we can, but um, there are a, a handful of things that I like out there. Um, but yeah, my favorite admin stuff for query monitor uh, for being able to see what's going on in the background, user switching. When you have a lot of users and somebody reports a bug and you want to be able to go see what they're seeing in, in their admin. Um, public post preview, uh, being able to publish a post privately, but then be able to share it around with your department before it goes live. Uh, without people having to log in can also help because then you don't have to have everybody give everybody a, a login to the WordPress site. Um, and then, yeah, like Jennifer said, there's big ones that, that are tough to maintain as part of a very large ecosystem of sites, but things like gravity forms give you thousands of hours of engineering already solved without having to resolve it. So. Yeah, and one thing I love them? is uh, the you, you often just see like usage of a lot of different plugins, which is really cool. Like again, that's something that's you know uh, a little bit different uh, for for higher ed compared to what we might see uh, in like other large enterprise contexts where perhaps there's less usage of uh, of a lot of different plugins. Maybe you're doing more custom stuff. I, I love that in higher ed, especially if you've got like student blog networks or or whatever. You know that that really allows for like a lot of the creativity and long tail that you get in like the WordPress ecosystem, which is, yeah, that's just like really cool to see. Uh, definitely post to posts is, is like a, a huge one. I think Steve was talking in the last session about um, like the ability to let people, you know, maybe, maybe it's students uh, do things from the front end, right? Reg register for their own site, submit some content. Uh, and so things like gravity forms, I think, you know, really that's actually quite a powerful capability for a university to be able to let people, submit things, do, you know, do things without having to like be a full admin user. Um, so we see that quite a lot as well. Yeah. We've got some answers in the chat, people. Someone mentioned ACF, which is I think really popular in higher ed and gravity forms. We've already kind of mentioned that. So it's kind of fun. Feel free to add your own plugins to the chat. It's kind of, it's fun to read, see what everybody's using. What about plugins that like there's a need for, right? Like, WordPress and higher ed has a lot of very unique like enterprise needs like um, governance is really big. I know, you know, I know of a college building a governance plugin that's really cool that I'm, I think they're going to share and that will be great. There's, um, there's lots of single sign on needs, which can get really complicated. Um, but most universities, you know, need something like that. And so are there any other types of plugins you think that there's like needs for that are kind of missing in the space? I think uh, one of my wish lists, I think, yeah, I think one of the wish lists is just making sure that like you can see where things are used or not used um, so that you can get rid of stuff. You know, as a site grows over time, I think it becomes uh, pretty full. <laughs> so I would love something that that would help identify the things I can just get rid of. Oh, yeah, like an archival, like, a, like an archival policy. Um, the kind of, or to help your support your archival policy. Mm -hmm. And that kind of falls in line with like governance. Like a lot of higher ed websites have like hundreds of users with thousands upon thousands of content. And it's really hard to stay on mm -hmm. top of 
is this content fresh? Is this still valid? You know, is it does it need to be archived? Those types of functionality is really helpful and and there's not really like and that I know of, please tell me if I'm wrong, there's not really a plugin right now that really exists to kind of support yeah, that. Yeah, not that need. I know of off the top of my head for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think it was like it, it would be nice to see you know, quite a lot of the plugins we've been talking about, I guess, are like, you know, higher ed repurposing, you know, existing plugins that exist to like, you know, achieve their needs. I think there there, there could be a bit more of, of like, uh, you know, there's some really common needs that actually could be turned into like plugins or, uh, you know, libraries or, or what have you. Um, that Yeah, that speak, you know, they're built specifically for these purposes. I think, that, I think that's like uh, something that um, it would be cool to see, you know, maybe over the next couple of years, a lot of universities doing doing cool stuff. Uh, a lot of a lot of us like service providers in the space, build, probably building the same things, you know, uh, um, uh, over and over again. And so, yeah, there's prob probably some, some something that could be done there to uh, to build some like higher ed specific plugins that solve some of these things in like an even slicker way. Right. We talked about we our group talked about this in our kind of preliminary discussion about like. Mm. why open source is so great for higher education and the kind of the mission of that plus WordPress and how it kind of supports this mission of sharing. Like yeah. if we, as a, as universities just kind of had a better ecosystem of sharing of like, mm -hmm. of elevating these needs, like knowing what's out there knowing what people's needs and presenting that in a way where others could support those needs, whether it's universities sharing what they build or maybe even, um, you know, vendors and outside agencies like human made, you know, supplying yeah. these needs, you know, that would be really valuable. And those are, those are things going away in the brain for later. We'll, yeah. you know, we'll see what can come of that. Yeah. Have you seen much of um, that, Jeremy? You know, you've been, you've been in, in, in higher ed, uh, you know, for, for a long time. So I wonder, oh yeah, I wonder, I wonder if you. Yeah. Seen well, I think everybody's good at talking about, so there's communities like WP campus where yeah. everybody's really good at sharing what they're doing and, um, bouncing back and forth ideas and then at conferences you you all talk about what you're doing i think like rachel says universities higher ed on a budget you don't yeah there's not the budget for everybody to go out and actually devote parts of their week to maintaining plugins or talking about the work they're doing but mm. i think there are universities with big budgets and right. they're hiring agencies with big budgets and i think if you yeah, well, my, my mini soapbox is if you look at the university mission statements for all of those, many of them are about benefiting society or distributing information, and that should extend to the work they're doing mm. day to day. So I think there's like room for a sharing opportunity there even. Yeah, for like just that. saying, you know, we're going to hire an agency to do this work, but then that agency is also going to open source everything. And whether or not that has to become a, a maintained plugin or just a public repo where you can see the code. Yeah. Um, and then for... For even smaller groups that don't have a big budget, I think you can carve out some time to write blog posts and publish what you're doing and kind of pave the way for people who haven't done it yet. Yeah, the real the real value is that in higher ed, especially, we are enterprise on a budget. And so the more you can, you know, sh share and reuse, the more time that we have to do innovative things and to focus on our unique needs and we're not having to reinvent the wheel all the time. So I, I will share that as WP campus from the leadership perspective is really trying to focus and move towards um, data, like data, the value in these types of data and how we can organize that and present that. So we'll hopefully can kind of see some of that, but like, this is stuff that I would love campus. I saw, I call that for short WP campus to start doing is to, Maybe to collect these things, what plugins people are using, what plugins mm. people need, maybe hosting a, 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 an asset of like, here's here's plugins that people have open source and are sharing and are managing. And so we can kind of collectively um, bring value to each other and, and in support of our missions. Yeah, um, yeah that would be really cool. Um, so I let's dive back into, you know, WordPress usage. Um, I, you know, what kind of, what kind of roadblocks do, do we see people facing with WordPress and higher ed? Like WordPress is very flexible and very powerful and, but we do have this very unique environment. And so that we, sometimes we do have to come up with very custom solutions 
things like that. I I I love to just talk about those things because a there's like we've always said like if we find if we kind of bring these roadblocks to light, then we can come up with solutions. So, you know, Jennifer, do you do you want to share any kind of like day to day roadblocks or issues that you face using WordPress? Um, I wouldn't say we have roadblocks, but I think that there's things we have to kind of get around because WordPress has some quirks. So like the kind of the one we run into all the time because we host so many organization sites inside of our site is the, you know, if you have different pages that have the same title as each other, like everybody wants a people page or our events page. And so you have to get creative about, you know, renaming slugs so that, you know, somebody doesn't try to go to one person's page for people and end up on somebody else's. That's happened a lot. It's this weird, quirky little bug. Um, I think the other thing that people don't, plan for is like so in higher ed nobody wants to get rid of any content ever and so some of our plugins are not easy to upgrade because you know we have so many of one post type that they don't plan ahead for that and they think you're just going to get rid of it and then you try to upgrade and it just gets stuck and so we've had to like build kind of an, an archive post type uh so that we can move it out of the way and then and then do our upgrade path. So um, I think, you know, in in enterprise and, and tech, you know, nobody ever plans for, for people to keep everything forever. Things expire. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the common theme for you, Jennifer, is this like enterprise level content management, like governance, like there's a real need for, I think there's a real need in our space for like governance management. Mm -hmm. um, what do, you, what do you think, Jeremy? So when I think about, well, all enterprise, but higher ed specifically, when you have many different sites operated by many different people, um, branding is a key theme of that. So the university has a central brand, but then maybe the college has a sub-brand of that. And then maybe there's a tertiary, like the department has another brand. Um, the full site editor has been super cool because it's given us the opportunity to build out these very sharp looking sites that people have a lot of control over and to give them patterns that they can reuse to implement this brand stuff. But um, it's kind of like all or nothing still. So you either give somebody full access to the full site editor, at which point mm. they can accidentally remove editing of the templates um, or you remove access completely and then they can only edit page content. So I think there's a lot of room for somebody well, I think it first needs to be solved in WordPress core where there's a stronger capability system um, for blocking down various parts, which I imagine will be coming because we're talking about collaborating on content and stuff. Um, so that's a, I think there's problems to be solved there. I think WordPress will solve some of them, but then I think we'll be forced to, to solve some of the other ones and kind of establish what brand governance kind of means inside the editor. Probably a couple of the common themes that we see. I guess maybe the first, I think, touched on in the UIC presentation earlier is just the like, you know, WordPress tends to have been around for a long time, ends up being used for all sorts of things. And so over time, I guess its flexibility uh, is the reason that it gets used for all these things. But then over time, you end up with this like sprawling, you know, somewhat uh, or ever ever growing kind of complex um, beast of uh, you know WordPress networks hosted in various places, and like mm -hmm. yeah, the person who set it up is no longer there, and and uh, you know all of that kind of uh, complexity. Which yeah, it's like a, it's the other side of the coin of oh, it's just so easy to get going. That's great. We can spin this up on WordPress. Um, uh, so yeah, I see that as like a common, uh, you know, common challenge where we we might end up then st come in and kind of help. Okay, how can we just like rethink about this? Be smart, uh, make some changes. You know, add Cadam and uh, um, talked about that earlier. And then I guess the the other side to that is probably just like the pace of innovation of WordPress itself. I think brings some challenges, especially like now with Gutenberg and the full site editor and like you know it can be difficult to adopt those things. It can be particularly difficult to adopt those things. Uh, you know, uh, 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 across the whole network. And so like, uh, and, you know, we're already moving on to the next thing. Um, and so I think that, um, again, that's like a big asset in other areas actually, but uh, for other use cases of WordPress, but I think I think it's like a, can be a challenge for higher ed institutions, which are like, actually we're happy with the thing we've got. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, at higher There's ed, a... we don't just like redesign websites like, you know, every six months or anything. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so there's Did something in that too. Where, yeah, there's, it's not really a roadblock, but it's something to really pay attention to the, the governance of features on the platform. Mm -hmm. I think it's a big one because it is so easy to just add features. And so mm -hmm. you're in a small web department and people come to you saying, can I do this with WordPress? I found this plugin. Sure. Install the plugin, activate it. And that's where you start to get in trouble. So it, yeah, there's a, there's governance in, in technology and then there's governance in like kind of just being able to tell people um, we can't do that yet or let's add that to a roadmap for for a year from now or something. Yeah, and it's, yeah, I mean, it always ends up being that mix of like, okay, yeah, there are some like, you know, smart technology things you can do to make this thing like, you know, 10 times easier to run and manage. And But there's also a bunch of, yeah, it's actually governance and uh, strategy and okay, maybe you close that thing down and you move that over here and um yeah that being able to to like tackle the problem from both sides i suppose yeah yeah there's there's tech governance and then there's people governance as right. you know mm -hmm. like a lot, there's a lot of people governance when you've got 300 users and and if you can't make yeah. the technology control them or control their behavior then you have to train and 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 people yep. and uh there's you know, there's all kinds of challenges and fun times involved with that um, you know, another, let's, let's talk about accessibility, right, too. It's a big thing in our space. And so there's, there's unique challenges, sometimes not necessarily be, like due to like WordPress, but like, there's your challenges in our space to make sure everything's accessible. Um, there's challenges like um, there, I, I have a hard, like, it's honestly still a challenge. And I think in the WordPress ecosystem to find plug front end plugins that make front end content that are accessible. It's, it's honest, I think a lot of people have to build mm. kind of custom front end solutions, mm -hmm. you know, to, to functionality, because it is very hard still to find plugins that are accessible. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's why we will often, you know, that, that'll be one of the main reasons we'll, we'll find, okay, actually, we're going to need to build a custom solution to this, you know, that there, there kind of is something out mm -hmm. there. But yeah, unfortunately, it's kind of blocked. And uh, you know on the accessibility side and it's uh it's going to be more complicated actually to uh to, to try and uh, retrofit that than it is to 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 do something custom it's always a fine balance there because there's there's long long-term kind of costs to doing something custom too in terms of technical debt and responsibility and things so it gets back mm -hmm. to governance again <laughs> yeah it's, and that's just like the main theme of our conversation right governance yeah. like we have yeah. to have governance what does that look like you have to kind of lock things down and you have to make people understand why templates are such a great thing because you know if you do find something you have to fix if you fix it in a template then it's fixed everywhere but then you have clients that are like but i want my thing to be sparkly and shiny and unique so so you have to balance balance that and make them understand when they don't want to <laughs> yeah there's you know um on the on the vein of sharing solutions, I've written plugins that have that restrict the ability for users to upload PDFs directly to WordPress, because we mm. have to go and make sure all the PDFs are accessible. We can't just let them go upload, because then we'll just go down this rabbit hole of inaccessible PDFs. So there's all kinds of these kind of interesting solutions that are really necessary in our space, and ultimately they should be they should be necessary everywhere. Let's be clear, but. They're extra necessary in our space to just make sure things are accessible. Um, so maybe I can share. I mean, as a service provider, and I, I bet Jer Jeremy kind of finds this too, like it's really nice actually to get to work with clients who uh, have like accessibility as a requirement. Like it's something we kind of care about because we care about the craft uh, and, uh, you know, making an accessible site is making a good site. But it's unlike for our, you know, more traditional enterprise clients, it's often us trying to convince them to do that. Oh, you really should mm -hmm. do this. Uh, and so it's uh, from our side that can be a really nice uh, a nice constraint that y'all are having to to deal with i suppose because it means we get to we get to bake that in from the beginning and we get to work with people who who like understand the importance of it right from the start yeah it makes it easier to say no to some things too because yeah you can true. talk through the benefits of accessibility and why mm -hmm. why something's going to create a poor user experience and then there's a good point in chat there, actually, which is that if you are like using plugins or or uh, 
or what have you, and you're finding they're not accessible. I try and it's always worth trying to reach out to the author, like, e even if they're not able actually to change, you know, to, to make the change then for you. Uh, the number one thing that is gonna like uh, uh, convince people who are building plugins to make them more accessible is if they're hearing all the time that uh, there's uh, a need for them to be accessible. So um, even if you don't get a good response in that moment, it's useful, it's useful to make it known. Yeah, to bring awareness. Like, yeah, mm. there's a need for your thing. We, we can't use it unless it's accessible, you know, and, and a raise, raising that need is really helpful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'll bring up the block editor, you know, like, then talk about that for a little bit. You know, that's, you know, when that came out, that was a big kind of, whoa, for, you know, a lot of universities, and we'll come back to the governance, right? Because for, for a lot of universities, it's, well, it's not just the fact that like innovating is kind of a struggle. We can't just turn around and like implement a new big piece of functionality out the gate. We have to plan for it. But also in the governance, right? Like the block WordPress and in, in my opinion and experience is really more designed for people like new, we talked about this, you know, bef um, in our, our kind of prelim discussion, it's kind of designed for new users. And so people like us that have been using it for a while and, it's also designed for people to give lots of options. Like the block editor is this powerful, flexible, customizable tool. And in higher ed, we're all like, whoa, you know, like we have design governance and that's is scary. And that's gotten better over time and it will continue to get better. But there are a lot of universities that still don't use the block editor for that reason, because there's just, there's too much unknown and too much, you know, um, overhead, so to speak, to kind of touch on that. And so, does anybody have any any thoughts about that or how they've kind of worked to overcome that frame of mind or reality, I guess is a better word. Yeah, I could uh, yeah. speak a little bit, I guess, about the um, the, the the first session to, to, of today with the Harvard Gazette. That was, uh, you know, we, we were we were able, we did that as a ground up redesign, so we were able to adopt the block editor and the full side editor. And so, yeah, that was a nice that was a nice opportunity to like really stretch the uh, the capabilities that are in the block editor around like you know you can uh, this this stuff you get the full full flexibility. This other stuff's more locked down. Um, like a really neat, a really neat, uh, some really neat accessibility stuff as well, which connects back to the to the previous uh, discussion we were having, where you know I think there's like a, a nice color picker, and you you that allows you to select from a set of ex of accessible safe colors, and um, uh, has a has a bunch of cascading effects across the site. Then in terms of like the the scheme, so I think the I, my my thing with the block editor and the full site editor is like a, in a lot of ways the product is like. Uh, outstripping outpacing our our like the ecosystems like understanding of even what's possible with it yet and like mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff we're still waiting for us all to catch up and like figure out okay this is how we're supposed to use it in these contexts these are the like uh yeah the patterns that make sense um, so i think a lot of that flexibility is there if we just haven't like figured it all out yet you know i think it we're at a point where yeah, however integrated you are with your design team, you need to all of a sudden become maybe more integrated uh, with how the brand is established and how it's applied on the web. Because there's an opportunity now to create a brand template that gives you a lot of flexibility in the middle, maybe, but maintains that, you know, university navigation, the footer, all of that stuff. Um, but there's, yeah, there's so much flexibility in the block editor for what you can do with content. So it's not just a, I arrive at the page, here's all the design stuff, and then here's words in the middle. But now you can have the flowing page of images and words and call outs and, and things um, pretty easily from a content editor's perspective. They don't have to go ask for help from somebody to, to implement like a splash marketing page anymore. Um, but there's that, you have to design for that so that you know pieces are fitting together the right way, like you expect them to. Yeah, I think I love Carlos's comment in the chat. It's like, that's kind of where we're at too. We do not use the black editor. Everything's mm -hmm. locked down and you deal with it on the, on the back end of just like, you can put the content in, these are the layouts you can choose and everything else is kind of predefined. And then that gives us the ability to, to build in certain flexibility, but then keep everything very consistent across the board. 
and um, you know, and not have somebody's page look really, really weird all by itself. There's another. It's a, yeah, it's under, oh, go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there's another weird cycle that we go through with WordPress because there's, uh, you know, the classic things block editor. That's its own cycle. But there's this other one where we spent a lot of years as a blogging platform. And then we tried so hard to convince people that we were a content management platform. The weird, you know, custom post types, pages, building out ways to manage lots of content. And then all of a sudden we flipped it completely and said, oh, now we're a site design tool. And hmm. the content management part hasn't caught up yet with the site design tool part. So there will be another phase, I'm pretty sure, where we have to figure out how those kind of merge hmm. back together. And, make it easy on, on everybody. I think that's the coolest thing is having everything in a database because we're able to leverage all the content in our website and many other platforms. So we're, we're using, you know, all the profiles to, to populate directories that are in, you know, you know, in, in the lobby of the building where it's like, you can figure out where somebody is and cause it's talking to other systems because it is a content management system, very structured database. And then using those post to post relationships, you know, we can, you know, everybody's putting in news posts and events and all that stuff. And we can automate the website for the clients. So they only have to go in, you know, when they have time or when they want to edit their site. Um, it, it just, it's so flexible that we can power so many things. It's not just the website. We're powering newsletters and, you know, <laughs> announcements and so many things. I think Got an it. interesting, you know, reality of, of how we use higher, use WordPress and higher ed is we are a space that actually imports a lot of different content from other platforms too, to be displayed on our WordPress. Cause we build a lot of mm -hmm. kind of, marketing informational brochure sites where we're importing events from like a university events management system or we're importing faculty profiles and displaying them and things like that. And so it's, it is kind of, it's, it's another kind of interesting reality of how we use WordPress. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something, Tom? Uh, no, no, all good. All good. I just wanted you, to add about the... so, uh, you covered oh, okay. <laughs> I was just gonna I was gonna add like another comment about the block editor is that it is kind of interesting uh, an interesting kind of reality of WordPress and higher ed is that you know eventually you kind of have to move to the block editor whether whether or not but I mean it's obviously you have the choice to move when you want but one reality that we face is plugins as the years go by and plugins update to use the block editor and you're not on the block editor you know, at a certain point, you won't be able to use a lot of plugins. And that's like a reality that's being, that's being faced. For, for example, you know, I, I, I work with the university that doesn't use the block editor, you know, and they wanted to implement like an accessibility plugin, but it only works with the block editor. So they can't, you know, so, so at some point there has to be this kind of convergence. And I, and I, I think more and more universities are, are adopting and it's coming like, but it is kind of a reality of the, of, of our options, the kind of more time goes on, they, you kind of, the options kind of are limited and things like that. And that's just kind of a reality of innovation, right? It is, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one nice, one nice thing there should be that as you know, that's true, but also uh, the, eco the, the stuff should be getting better all the time. So the, it should also get easier and easier, you know, uh, to, to make that jump, hopefully, because uh, as all these like edge cases and things get ironed out and, uh, and smoothed over. Yeah. yeah. I think that that particular university is, we're, they're redesigning. They're going through this like three year redesign. So I think that they're going to move when that happens. Yeah. It's like um, but that's another reality, right? Like we have to kind of wait until yeah. we could do a redesign. And, they, and that might be a three year process because you have to work with, you know, design and all these, and you're, you're migrating and redesigning like 60,000 pages. You know, it's not going to be a six month project. It's one of the reasons I'm pretty um, excited about this upcoming, well, in progress now, day deliberation project that um, was, uh, I guess, announced back at State of the Word and I think is just like start getting started, which is mostly about making it like super easy to move from other platforms to WordPress. But I think a, a really interesting part of that is also going to be 
making it much easier to move between like different flavors of WordPress. How do I move from ACF to the to Gutenberg, or how do I move from yeah classic, you know, into full site editing? Like a lot of those migration paths are pretty complex, actually, even within WordPress, and could be mm-hmm. like much much better. And so I think that's like something that could improve quite a lot over the next year or two um, if that project's a success. This team is literally hiring a contractor just to do that. Like awesome. that is yeah. that is the reality. Like it's yeah. complex and they need somebody who's like gonna be in charge of like figuring right. that out. Um, okay, so why don't we dive into some questions? I know we know we're already running behind and that's fine, but let's dive into some questions. It's kind of hard to tell like the order the questions came in, so I apologize. Um, I think it's top down. In higher I think, ed, so I think maybe people have voted ed. them as well. So maybe the ones at the top are the highest oh. voted. Yeah. Well, there's four questions and three of them have one upvote. So it's okay. <laughs> uh, in higher ed, it's not uncommon to see multi site networks that contain a single yet compartmentalized site, which is not necessarily uh, what it was designed for. Is any, hold on, let me slow down. This is a complex question. In higher ed, it's not uncommon to see multi site networks to contain a single yet compartmentalized site. I think this person is talking about multi tenancy. Does that sound right, Jeremy? Is anyone on the panel familiar with work that's being done to solve problems that stem from this use of WordPress multi-site, specifically related to sharing data between sites or centrally managing things cross-site? So basically what they're, I think what they're describing is separate installs of WordPress that are, yeah. You read it as multi-site. I think they're describing yeah, or like maybe a multi-network and some of the networks only have a one site on them. One site on it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Which they is, have different so databases, it, so they're, he's trying to share content between like the yeah. database tables. Right. Yeah, how to, basically, from how I read it, how to share content between uh, sites on a network, which is not easy by default. Um, in WordPress. No, yeah, and it's, it's not something but, like I think it's the the multi-site stuff actually is a little bit of an underloved uh, area of core innovation. So there, there, I think there would be some cool stuff that could be done there. Um, sorry. Yeah, like we have the API um, and stuff now, and yeah, yeah, like what are solutions that people? There are some like an API, there for like API syndication. Uh, uh, yeah, like cross-site syndication is there, there's some good plugins around that. Mm-hmm. A common thing I we also see is like maybe you'll have a you'll have one of your sites be the kind of um, the the template site or the the uh, document storage site or the image storage site and then you'll kind of syndicate those out make that available like maybe the that's the media library and then uh, where all the content's uploaded and uh, that's syndicated across all the sites or something but yeah nothing really specific to the to the question. I added one plug in there. It's an old plug in that we made at WSU. And it hasn't been updated in years, but syndicates content between sites. Nice. Um, so that's one possibility. Oh, you put it in the comment on the question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's true. I could put it in the chat. You put it in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's let's move on to the next one. Um, does anyone have any examples of a design system built for WordPress? Um, akin to the US DWS design system. I did click the button to put the uh, question on stage, but I realized it was just showing up completely in front of you, Jennifer. So I've turned that off. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> a little bit of a flaw in this platform. Um, does anyone have any? Anyone, anyone in the chat, feel free to add if you know of any design system examples. I, I know of. Well, I know of a government WordPress theme that's using the USDWS and putting it into a WordPress theme called Civic Press, but I that's the only thing I can think of. That would be really cool to have or see it. That would be a good use case or case study if anybody. Yeah, feel free a... to answer in chat as well if uh, if you do know of anyone anything in chat. We do have a talk at WP Campus in two weeks about design using design tokens in WordPress. And I'm really looking forward to that presentation. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's a presentation on how someone kind of used, Fig, I think Figma with design tokens to kind of power 
their WordPress theme. So I think that'll be a really cool example. Like I'm look definitely wanna I'm definitely gonna attend that one. Um all right. Do you all have suggestions or things to avoid when working with a third party to develop a full site editor theme for your institution? Good question. Any thoughts? I can share a couple of the, I think a couple of the learnings on our side. Hmm. Probably the most, probably the most common thing I see is just like a, you, uh, unregister all the stuff that come all the blocks that you get with wordpress and then just create a bunch of custom ones for yourself like i think that's uh, i see that be like quite a common uh first go at using the block editor um and i've seen i've seen us like you know ru run into issues with ourselves even like in the early days writing too many cost cu uh, custom blocks rather than you know the really the beauty of of full set editing on the block editor is is how you can like uh uh, build these these layouts and, and this content out you know out of all of the uh, all of the blocks that are already there um, and that if you remove if you just remove all of those and build custom stuff you kind of lose out on that a bunch and plus now you're maintaining a bunch of custom like if you do that really wrong you can end up essentially cre recreating like custom meta boxes but with custom Gutenberg blocks or something which is like yeah you're really missing out on the power there so yeah I'd encourage people to think yeah think think uh, first of all just like okay how could we reuse uh, the the patterns and the blocks that that you get like for free with WordPress, uh, and then smartly extend those, make the odd custom block, make the odd custom pattern. Um, that's probably been one of our main learnings. I think for a full site editing theme specifically, um, make sure you get very granular in your template parts. If you're going to be reusing that theme on multiple sites, there's going to be a time where you want to overwrite something in the navigation, but then if you ship a new version of the theme, now you have to do manual work on every site to to sync it. So get very small yeah, with your, kind of an your template problem problems. Still, but yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. The last question, which is a doozy of a question: How do you ensure that all content published is accessible and compliant? That is a that is a question. Well, if we'd cracked that, <laughs> we'd all be millionaires I mean, living in a mansion. That's, that's a whole <laughs> other panel discussion. That's a whole other like we could talk. I mean, yeah, that's a loaded question. There's a lot. I mean, there are some plugins you can use um, to help with that, but a lot of a lot of that really comes down to people governance. Mm -hmm. A lot of that really comes down to training and education making sure people actually understand what they're doing when they're making and editing websites. You know, a lot of making sure they understand the, the results of decisions they're making when they're putting in content and how that affects users. Um, you know, making sure people understand how web, honestly making sure people understand how web technology works in general is a huge educational boost because a, a lot of them don't, they don't understand when, that when they do something, it does this and why is that a problem? Um, helping people understand how people use websites is very important when it comes to education. A lot of people don't understand. They only kind of know how they use websites. They don't understand that there are a hundred other ways that people actually interact with web content. Um, a lot of people don't even really understand that like when you're making websites, you're actually talking to a computer and then a computer is translating your website to users. And how that really works with like accessibility and understanding what's happening and you are writing in a language that has to be translated um so there's a lot of education and training but then there are a lot of tools that can help with oversight after the fact right like people make mistakes so we can use tools to do oversight we can use tools that are part of the wordpress ecosystem and then we can use tools that are outside of the wordpress ecosystem that you know scan and run tests on fully built out pages you know you can't test inside of a WordPress screen, but your context is going to be limited. Like you can only have so much of your web page context inside the admin. There's, you can have a lot, but you can't have 100%. You can only have 100% on the other end of when the page is published, right? So when the page is published, there's lots of tools also that you can use. So any other thoughts of on top of that? 
Mm, maybe a couple of like specific oh go on jennifer if you had something to add that oh i was just gonna say this is where we lean hard on templates right so mm. people can put the you know they can put the content into certain fields in the back end and then that way we're forcing it on the front end to use the right you know the right settings and the right code um but then also finding you know like like rachel mentioned the external site or the tools that you can find when people make mistakes and then educate them or go go fix it when you find it and not just the, go on how. the governance yeah. go ahead jerry not just the how but the why i think is the important part getting people to buy into accessibility means usability usability means good seo performance means mm -hmm. discoverability means you're actually communicating your message and not just putting stuff up on a website somewhere so mm -hmm. exactly um yeah but kind of like as we've been talking about this whole time the governance like and as jennifer mentioned like having templates like sometimes accessibility means locking down options sometimes mm -hmm. it means limiting our choices and following our brand and design governance and following, you know, all these things because we have to in order to make sure that with all these pieces moving, that we are producing an accessible result. Mm -hmm. All right, I feel like we have very cool. We've done, we've, we've done a good job. I'll just I'll promote campus really quick. WP Campus 2024 is in two weeks from today, which is exciting. Um, it's in person at Georgetown University in Washington D.C., but we also stream all of our sessions online for free. You just have to go to 2024.wpcampus.org to register. So I hope you'll join us there and we can keep talking about all this fun stuff. I'll awesome. hand it over to you, Tom. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much. Very much enjoyed uh, taking part in that. So thanks very much for having me. I know I was a little, I was a bit of a late addition, so uh, appreciate the welcome. Um, I hope everyone, I, I think just based on how interactive chat was whilst we were going, I think take that as a pretty good sign. I think that that's uh, a session that uh, people have enjoyed. So thanks very much for that. I'm going to um, click these buttons to pop you into the wing. So I'm waving by as I'm doing that because that takes you off stage. Uh, Jeremy, that should be you. There we go, Jennifer. Great, okay. Um, and um, feel free to hang around there. I think we can still hear your audio. So just to let you know that you can mute if you'd like, um, or you can just uh, drop um, while I do my little wrap up. Um, alrighty folks, we're, we're arrived at the end of the final session, um, which means that uh, we're almost done for the day. Um, I think I've probably got a couple of things to say. Yeah, I'm getting messages now saying, please mention feedback polls in lobby. Um, so, uh, that, okay. So I think that you'll have to do that after I finished. Cause if you go and do that now, you'll leave this session and join the lobby, but go and join the lobby, have a look at the polls there, specifically the one, um, uh, about asking for feedback on this event. We would love feedback on this event. Um, we put a bunch of effort into these events and, uh, feedback is very, very useful as we figure out how to like make them even more useful and interesting and fun um what other things am i being asked to say um yes if you missed anything today uh maybe you popped in and out for sessions um uh, maybe you weren't even able to be here and so you're not even hearing me say this um all of the videos from the sessions are going to be going up online uh pretty soon um and um we'll be i guess letting everyone know who's on the newsletter list know via email or you can just you know check out our youtube channel or the site give us a like and a subscribe i think it's probably traditional to say there um and uh, yeah so you'll be, you'll be able to to catch everything that's been shown today um on our youtube over the coming days um okay fantastic i think that's that's the main things i'm supposed to plug um so i think that i mean i can just finish with some thank yous um so first of all i wanted to start by thanking dopey campus themselves who've partnered with us with us on this event um and um just do like a ton of really wonderful work bringing together wordpress uh, and the higher education uh, kind of ecosystem and communities um and so i imagine everyone here is very familiar uh, with them but but if you're not you should definitely check them out you're in for a treat um and um as was already mentioned, actually, there is a uh, an event upcoming, um, which uh, I don't know whether I can 
no, I can't. Uh, I was going to try and share it, but that's not working. Anyway, they actually have an in-person event. So if you've enjoyed anything about today, um, then you would love this in-person event even more because there's three days of sessions, networking, socializing. Um, it's in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University, uh, 31st of July to the 2nd of August. Um, quick plug, actually, uh, the amazing Jolene, who uh, co-presented the first session of the day, uh, one of my colleagues at Cuba made, um, she's going to be hosting a session uh, at, at campus, uh, Dopey Campus, so definitely uh, go check that out. Um, and um, as Rachel mentioned, you can uh, go there in person or, or attend virtually, so um, there's no excuse not to be there. Um, okay, so yeah, thanks. Thank you to Dopey Campus, really, really has meant a lot being able to partner with them on this. Um, second, I just want to thank everyone who's, who's presented all the sessions today. Uh, this was like a lineup I'm, I'm feeling really proud of being able to bring together, actually. I think there were some really great sessions, um, a really nice mix of like insight from the WordPress space and also like real experience from, from people who actually work at universities and are actually using WordPress, um, which is, I think, a, yeah, a really nice mix. Um, and like, it's not easy. It's not easy to turn up and do a 20 minute uh, session. Everyone did brilliantly. Um, and so thank you very much. Um, and last but not least, uh, it's been my face up here from Human Made. Um, but as I'm sure many of you will suspect, uh, it's not actually me that's done all of this on my own. There's a ton of people behind the scenes who've been working hard for like a long time uh, to make this happen. Um, as anyone here who's been involved in event organization will know, uh, there's a lot to do, uh, especially to pull off like an event with high production value that's got a tight, tight schedule um, and, and like flow as well, which I, which I think... Uh, hopefully we've pulled off today. Um, and so I want to say thank you to all of them. And I want to say I'm, I'm really proud of the quality of the event that we've been able to put on. So well done. Um, okay, that just leads me to thank you for coming. Uh, really, really, really appreciate, appreciate it. Do leave that feedback. We plan to do more events uh, through the year. Um, and so we'd love to hear from you if you've got thoughts on uh, what you'd like to see at those events, what you think we could be doing differently or better. Um, do let us know. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'll do my final wave of the day um, and I'll stop recording and take myself off stage.